Okay, well, he may not have been, the prophet may not have been criticizing people for their sins so much in the passages we've talked about so far, but it's certainly up front and central here. Right, you know from the beginning of chapter one, right, uh, that the people are, that somebody's going to be in trouble, yeah. right? Because whenever somebody calls for sort of heavenly witnesses, Yes. They're about to lay some thunder down, right? It's generally yeah. how that goes. Yeah, I mean, this is often associated in the, in the Bible with the idea of a lawsuit, a reeve. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, you know, I don't know that it's covenantal necessarily here, but still, I mean, it's, it, it, it's bringing an accusation. That's right. Uh, for other countries, heaven and earth would count as deities that are being called to witness. Mm -hmm. Now, the occasion of this one, uh, he says, your country lies desolate, and daughter Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a shelter in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. So we know that chronologically we are not at the beginning, even though we're at the beginning of the book. Right. In fact, we're probably pretty close to the end. Exactly. Uh, because the, the situation that this calls to mind is surely the invasion of Sennacherib. Mm -hmm. Uh, where Sennacherib boasted that he shut up Hezekiah in Jerusalem like, like a, bird a bird in a cage, cage. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, destroyed pretty much the rest of the country. Yeah. In fact, the argument has been made that this is why they could centralize the cult a little bit later, because all the other places had been destroyed anyway right. and, and taken out of business. So you see, it's coming then, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about Sennacherib and um, Hezekiah's role in it in a few minutes in the next segment, mm -hmm. but uh, did he do, was it good to rebel against Assyria or <laughs> was it not? You see, we tend to assume it must have been good. Yeah, it depends how you look at it. Yeah. It's almost never a good idea, pragmatically. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> right, nobody, nobody successfully <coughs> did, did so. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a question of right, how one pushes back, right? Do we simply let them come through, right? Obviously, Sennacherib destroyed everything but Jerusalem. Yeah. So there must have been, you know, there must be some resistance of some kind, but not enough. Not enough to be effective at any rate. Um, a few years ago, I was in Berlin and uh, we went to see there's a church that had been built by the Kaiser Wilhelm, mm -hmm. the Wilhelmskirche, that was left in ruins as a monument to the war, and this passage was quoted. Uh, the implication being, you know, we brought this upon ourselves, mm -hmm. and I thought it was quite moving to see the application of it. But it's interesting that that's how Isaiah seems to have thought about Jerusalem. Whereas you would think they were within their right, so to speak, to rebel against Assyria. But uh, that doesn't seem to be the way the prophet looked at it. Yeah, everything we've talked about so far has been how Isaiah sort of knew that the bad was coming and what Israel should do in response. But here we sort of get commentary on the why the bad is coming, right? Why is it that Israel is deserving of this kind of... Uh, of overrunning. Yeah. And again, this is, with Assyria, it's, it's new, right? This is a new kind of international situation that prophets had to, had to learn how to deal with. What does it mean for the whole country to suddenly be at risk? Yeah. Um, what have we collectively all done uh, now, to, to bring this on? See, I think part of the issue for a prophet like Isaiah is if you enter into a treaty with the foreign power, even if it's a treaty whereby you agree to be the vassal and to send tribute, then you're bound by that. And that it's wrong to break the oaths of your treaty. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I think some of that may be in the background here. But, but, but he but doesn't think that Israel has been all good either. No, he doesn't. He doesn't, and in fact, uh, not only have they not been all good, but even when they were trying to be good, when they thought they were being good, 
Because in, in verse 10, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, you people of Gomorrah. We're not calling a place Sodom and Gomorrah. Has never been good. Has never <laughs> been good. And, and uh, you know, it may not necessarily uh, allude to sodomy, as we would use the word. Certainly but at not. least it is uh, indicating there's trouble coming. Mm -hmm. Now, but what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who ask this from your hand? Trample my courts no more, bringing offerings is futile. I'm weary of bearing your festivals and so forth. You know, if you've read, <clears throat> say, the Pentateuch, or yeah. other great chunks, Ezekiel, plenty of chunks of, uh, of literature, you would be very surprised to hear somebody in the, uh, in the Bible say, that sacrifice is unwelcome. You would, but now he isn't the only one saying it at this point in time. Right. Because you get this also famously in Amos, mm -hmm. take away from me the noise of your songs. Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you make of it? Do you think that this is actually a condemnation of the ritual and the cult that had been at the center of Israel's sort of corporate religion and faith? Well, you know, I think it is a condemnation of the cult as it was being practiced. Which is how? Which is, uh, people were going, bringing their sacrifices, and feeling then that they were good, that they had done all that the Lord required mm -hmm. of them. So it's and not, it's not about, it's not about actually what they were doing. They're doing the exact same thing that they're supposed, supposed to be doing. doing. But there are a lot of other things that they're supposed to be doing that they're not doing. Aha. Uh -huh. And Bringing the sacrifices makes them feel absolved, mm -hmm. makes them feel justified. Now, I think it's important to bear in mind that none of these prophets was a philosopher or a <laughs> theologian. They're not systematic thinkers. Right. You know, they speak to particular occasions. So if you asked Isaiah, is it wrong in all circumstances to offer sacrifices to the Lord? Uh, you know, he wouldn't understand the question. <laughs> he, he, he wouldn't understand the question. I think for anybody at that time, it would have been inconceivable, mm -hmm. maybe to have a cult where you didn't have some kind of sacrifice. Sure. But what, they, what he's speaking to is the way you're doing it now. And it's not that you're bringing the wrong kind of animals, and it's, it's, the, it's the priority. It's the, the importance you attach to it. Right. It's that you think that simply by going through the rote cultic ritual motions, mm -hmm. you have done what God wants from you. Exactly. And, and, and instead, right, the idea is, it, it, it's, it's not if I bring these sacrifices, I will be good. It's really, you ought to be good before you bring before sacrifices. You bring the sacrifice. right? When sacrifice is understood as the conduit, the, the way that one can communicate, can, uh, right? even we think of right, the Psalms, we think of these as sort of the liturgy of the temple. Right? This is where people said what they, want, what they felt yeah. and asked for things. You never would go to the temple to recite your psalm of thanksgiving or a, or a request without a sacrifice to accompany it. So if sacrifice is part of the way that you communicate with God, God is essentially saying through Isaiah, actually, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to talk to you if this is how you're behaving, uh, you know, in the rest of your lives. You cannot simply walk in and do right, the rote ritual yeah. act and, ex and expect results. Yeah, I think what, uh, what both Isaiah and Amos and Hosea and my, you know, all the 8th century prophets mm -hmm. were, were trying to do was shift the focus. What's the most important thing? And I think they are saying fairly emphatically, the sacrifices in themselves are not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Amos says, did you bring me sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness? From which you can conclude he mustn't have read the book of Leviticus. Exactly. <laughs> if he had, it would be obvious that they did. Yeah. But, but he's assuming they didn't. Right. And it would be hard to 
maintain much of a sacrificial cult if you're wandering around in the wilderness, I imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the point he was trying to make is that's not of the essence. Not necessarily that it's wrong in all circumstances or that you shouldn't have it at all. And I think that's what Isaiah is trying to do too. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's actually suggesting that the cult does function the way you, it's supposed to when it's approached by, you know, as, as, the, as one of the Psalms says, right, uh, who may go up to the mountain of the Lord, right, one who is, yeah. right, pure hands and a, and a clean heart, right, there's, yeah. right, it, it's, it's, not, it's not simply a, a panacea, it's a little, right, Isaiah's message, not unsurprisingly, has a little bit of what would come to be sort of a Reformation message, to write a Protestant Reformation message to it, which I think is yeah. partly why, uh, you know, so much of, uh, you know, early biblical scholarship uh, and, and, I mean, going back to the Reformation, prioritize uh, Isaiah and these and 8th century and prophets. prophecy in particular over the law. Yeah. And over, over the cult, mm -hmm. and did so probably in a way that was more anti-Catholic than anti-Jewish, actually. Sure. But let's skip over to chapter 5, because th this is another passage where Isaiah sounds a bit like Amos mm -hmm. or the other uh, uh, eighth century prophets. Uh, he goes through the, the song of the vineyard, first of all. Uh, you know, the vineyard, it's a good thing, you figure. Uh, but then he says, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, break down its wall. And why? Because it didn't produce. Yeah. Yeah, it's one, it's one of the longest sort of extended metaphors in, yeah. uh, in Isaiah, but it's very much of a piece, right? Isaiah really loves the agricultural uh, metaphors. Yeah. Uh, I've always said that Isaiah is actually much easier to read if you're a farmer. Uh, you, yeah. you miss so much otherwise, but this is this very long agricultural uh, metaphor where, you know, Israel is this field that God has tended yeah. And it just yeah, it didn't work out, actually, right? <laughs> it's, got, it's gone bad. Yeah. But now he has more detailed explanation of how it didn't work out. Uh, ah, you who join house to house and field to field until there is room for no one but you and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land. What's he talking about? This is essentially about, it's, it's about social justice, right? This is about the wealthy... Uh, increasing their wealth at the expense of, of everybody else, right? This is his cows of Bashan, right, yeah. from, from Amos. Yeah, and in fact, he goes on, uh, you who rise early in the morning in pursuit of strong drink, who linger in the evening to be inflamed by wine, whose feasts consist of lyre and harp, neither, none of these prophets seem to have had much musical appreciation. <laughs> uh, there's a, an article by a scholar named David Kleins mm -hmm. in which he said, well, I mean, what's wrong, what's so bad about having a drink and listening to a little music? Uh, but I think what's so bad about it for these prophets is the contrast. Yeah, there's only so the, many, there's the, only a certain mm -hmm. you know, section of society that, that has the wherewithal this. and the leisure to, to drink and listen to music. Yeah, I mean, this stuff hasn't altogether lost its relevance, mm -hmm. it seems to be, mm -hmm. in the modern world. Specifically, I think what he was talking about there um, with the adding house to house and field to field is that how people were being forced into slavery or forced to mortgage their land to pay the king's tribute. Mm -hmm. We get this a lot in the Northern Kingdom. You get it a lot throughout the ancient world, and God knows, I mean, down to relatively modern times, mm -hmm. of tenant farmers then being forced into destitution. Yeah. So I think the force of the critique really is the contrast, right. the inequality. And uh, that that's, um, you know, one of the central things, I figure, in the message of the prophets, and one of the ones that remains most uh, pointedly relevant in uh, in modern times. Indeed. Um, we have maybe time to have a quick look at a little passage in chapter two, because you get almost the same thing in, 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 in uh, the book of Micah. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and the nations shall stream to it. 
And people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. For out of Zion shall come forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And the word for instruction there, of course, is Torah. Torah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that goes back to Isaiah? It's possible. It's possible. But it's mm -hmm. also hard at this point to think about um, uh, sort of Jerusalem as the, as the center uh, and, and the sort of the, the idea of consolidation of uh, yeah. the north and the south coming together. Uh, my sense is that you, like many, uh, would like to see this as a, as a later addition that goes perhaps, as we talked earlier, to the, the period of Josiah. Yeah, I think I'd find it very hard not to think of the period of Josiah. You know, when you have the Torah being proclaimed in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and an emphasis on only having cultic worship in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. so elevating the importance of Jerusalem and associating it with the Torah. But I would grant, you know, that it's, there is some continuity oh, yeah. here because part of this whole royal ideology is the centrality of Zion. Mm -hmm. Zion is the navel of the earth. Yeah. You know, the point at which earth is connected to heaven. And so th that's really what this passage is saying, I think, is that it will be recognized as the center of the earth. Right, which will become a, a central theme for second Isaiah, uh, yeah. who's picking up on, on much of this. Okay, so I guess we will move on in the next segment to discuss the threat that was posed to Jerusalem in the time of Sennacherib mm -hmm. in this long prose story towards the end of the book.